1 Timothy chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. We're going to read several verses tonight. I'm excited about the thought. The Lord just kind of put this on my heart yesterday. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Paul didn't just write this letter to young Timothy because he didn't have anything better to do. God commanded him to write it, and then God gave him the words to write. And then he goes on to proclaim what Miss Noreen just sang about, Jesus Christ is our hope. Look at verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Timothy was not his literal son, but he won Timothy to the Lord, and he raised Timothy in the truth of the Lord, and he looked at him as a son. He said, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went unto, into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves uh, with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, uh, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord uh, was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, <coughs> excuse me, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in church tonight. Thank you for the great singing, the great testimonies. Thank you for being a great God. Lord, we're ever so humbled to come before your presence, knowing what we deserve, but Lord, ever so grateful that we're not getting what we deserve, but we got grace and mercy. We got forgiveness and pardon. Lord, we bless your holy name. Now, Father, help your people. Lord, it's a dreary, rainy Wednesday night. Lord, they have faced much this week, but they find themselves in the house of God tonight. And so I pray you'd bless them abundantly. You do something special for their, for their soul. Do something special for their heart. God, I pray revival would even break out tonight. We would see a move of God in these days like we could only dream of. Lord, we'd see our country once again righted. We once again would be a Christian nation. All nations would fear us because they'd fear our God. God, I pray you do great and mighty things even here tonight. Bless your holy name and get glory to it. Well, thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. Amen. In this first letter that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he explains to Timothy why he left him at Ephesus and why he went on to Macedonia. You see, Timothy is a young pastor, and the old seasoned man of God is instructing him through this letter on things that he'll face and things that he has to deal with. Notice, if you will, the purpose for Timothy. Look in verse number 3. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, 
Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions uh, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. He says, Timothy, I left you there uh, to teach the truth, to stand on the truth, uh, to exhort other men to the truth, uh, not to be caught up in all kinds of vain questions and all kinds of uh, 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 things that don't bring merit, but things that edify the body of Christ uh, that they'll be built up in faith, uh, that uh, folks can see the impact Christ has made in their life, and that they too can be a witness to others. Uh, we see the purpose for Timothy. Now notice the problem at Ephesus. You have to understand, Ephesus was a central hub. Ephesus was a place of commerce. Uh, Ephesus was a great city. It also had a temple under Diana. Uh, uh, it was a wicked city. It was an ungodly city. Uh, and folks that had been saved there, uh, uh, if they weren't ta taught properly, they'd end up back in the same shape that they were. They, would, uh, they were all taught on wick uh, ungodliness and wickedness. And, and uh, uh, Timothy has been uh, uh, being instructed on how to stand true and how to be a light to these uh, dear folks in Ephesus. But notice, if you will, the problem that he faced. Look at verse 6. He says, from which, from which what? From which the truth, sound doctrine. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jaggling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Uh, the problem was, there was some that got too big for their britches and they swerved away from the truth. My dear friends, that story can be told thousands of times over since. Even in our day and age, there's some that have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. And they swerve from the truth, from sound doctrine. That's why Paul goes on to tell Timothy not to lay hands suddenly on no man. And you're not to lay hands on a novice. Uh, why? They get lifted up with pride and they'll swerve and they'll go away from the truth. Uh, uh, notice that these men who sought to teach the, the law uh, and do it unlawfully... Uh, Notice, first of all, they were unequipped. They weren't ready. Hmm? They were unequipped to take on the task that they desired. Now, in chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy, and this is in the message, I don't even know, it's not even in my notes, but he tells, tells uh, 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 Timothy, he, he lays out the qualifications uh, of a pastor, but, uh, you know, he makes it very clear uh, that they're not to be novices, that they're to be instructed in the ways of righteousness. There are many today that think they can handle it. I remember when I was a young preacher, I'd sit there on the pew thought I knew more than the pastor. Now, 30-something years later, I realize I still don't know anything. Very important to understand. These young men thought they knew something. Any young man that's willing to tell his pastor what he thinks should be done, that man don't know anything. Not according to Scripture. Hmm? So we see they were unequipped. They weren't ready. Notice, secondly, they were uneducated. Look at verse number 8. Now, good, verse 7, it said, desiring to be teachers of the law. In chapter 3, he says that the man who desired to be a bishop desires the good thing. It's one thing to desire something. It's another thing mm, to be called to do something. These guys desire to be teachers of the law. But he says they understand not what they say. Look in verse number 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. I don't get up and preach the law to you that are saved. We're not under the bondage of law. I don't get up and preach to you to bring a lamb so we can slay it before service. Hmm? I don't preach unto you that you're to keep the commandments and righteousness will be imputed unto you. Righteousness is imputed unto us by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm? He was our lamb. We don't preach the law to the saved. Yet this crowd that had swerved, it was uneducated, it's trying to take saved people and put them back under the law. 
he goes on to say this, the law is for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, and all that list of crowd that we named a minute ago. As a matter of fact, that whole crowd's in the NFL. All right? Uh, uh, but that whole crowd there, they're the ones that need the law because the law is our schoolmaster. It brought us to the knowledge of sin. It lets us uh, know what God says is sin. Uh, and therefore, they know that they're under the condemnation of the law. Uh, they're the enemies of God, uh, and they need to get right with God. The only way to get right with God is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, but they were uneducated. They were trying to put people under the law. I listen to a lot of young preachers today. Lord have mercy, we're in a mess. They think they know something, and they don't know anything. They're preaching what they heard somebody else preach. They haven't even studied it out to see if it's biblical. Mm -mm. They're unequipped. They were uneducated, but here's the important part. They were unempowered. They went, but they weren't sent. You ought to mark that down. Mm -hmm. It's God. As Paul will tell us later on, he thanked God that God enabled him, putting him in the ministry. It's God that calls a man, and it's God that sends a man. Mm -mm. And you say, preacher, how come you've been here 22 years? Because God sent me here. He's never sent me anywhere else. And there's a difference. Mm -mm. So we see there's a problem. We see the purpose for Timothy, the problem. Notice Paul's past. I'm about, I'm about to where we need to be. Look at verse 12. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, and that he counted me faithful. By the way, God doesn't put any man in the ministry that's not faithful. How in the world can somebody get up and preach somebody else being faithful and they're not faithful? And what confidence would you have in somebody that's not faithful? Now, I've got some hens around here, some mother hens, Miss Janet, Miss Mary, tells me not to preach after I had surgery and all that kind of stuff. Do you know why? Really? Do you know why I preach as quickly as I can? It's not that I don't know that you need to rest your body and let your body heal and all that kind of stuff. But, see, I realize I'm only going to be here for a short time. i got all of eternity to rest. But listen... Back in my ball playing days, I played hurt. I played injured. I played on a broken ankle. I played, and I played, and I played. I had articles written about me in the newspaper. I don't bring all this up much. Where I had a coach that said that if he'd have told me to run through a brick wall, I'd have done it or died trying. And I'm thinking in my mind, if that was said of me over something stupid as a ball game, why would I give Christ anything less? Hmm? Huh? I read what Jesus did for me, and so I just had surgery, big deal. Huh? It'll be all right. Hmm? Paul said he enabled me, counted me faithful, put me in the ministry. Now look at his past. Verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor? Paul had people killed who were saved mm -hmm. and injurious. And I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord uh, uh, was exceedingly, exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, 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 verse 14 is what Brother Donald was trying to say in his testimony over there a minute ago. Well, verse 15, this is a faithful saying uh, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners uh, of whom I am chief. God's already saved the chief. He can save all the rest of the Indians in the world. Are you listening? He was the chiefest of sinners, and God saved him. But his past, where he came from, he was a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious. Now look at the pattern. Look what Paul says. Verse 16, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Miss Noreen thanked the Lord for being long-suffering. Paul said the pattern started with him. 
how God was long-suffering with him. Even when uh, he was kicking against the pricks, God still uh, was working behind the scenes. God worked through the death of Stephen. God worked. He was long-suffering. Uh, yeah, he could have smoked Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he chose rather to be long-suffering. Then he saved him, uh, and then he used him in a great way to show a pattern. Uh, and Paul says in verse 17, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, visible, uh, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, the pattern was set forth that God subtly and constantly is working to redeem man from his sin. And if God can save Paul and use Paul, God can save and use anybody. What a blessing, huh? Now Paul went on, this is his first letter to Timothy, at the beginning of his first letter. At the end of his second letter to Timothy, he wrote this in chapter 4, verse 7. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Now, like Paul, we, know we have no problem looking to where God brought us from. You can go back and remember what it was like to be lost, remember what garbage dump God found you in, Remember what it was like to be a sinner? And you can testify and brag on God for the good grace of God. Didn't leave you where He found you. Came to where you was. Came to the ditch you was in like I preached on Sunday. You saved you. Changed your life. Uh, Set you on this path called straight. Uh, I played you a part of the family of God. Uh, 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 we have no problem looking back at our past. We have no problem looking forward to the future He's going to prepare for us. We like them songs about heaven. We like them songs about streets of gold and walls of jasper and gates of pearl. We like them songs about reunited with mama and with family. Uh, we like everything about uh, 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 walking hand in hand with Jesus. Uh, and what a day that'll be. We have no problem looking back to where he found us uh, and looking ahead to where he's taken us. Our problem is living present. I want to preach with God's help on this. Present living Christians. It's good to look back every now and then and see where God found you. It's all right looking ahead see where we're going. But if you spend too much time in either place, you're going to get out of balance. And you're not going to live. A lot of people are depressed out of their minds because they're in their past. Or a lot of people got pie in the sky um, uh, mentality because they're looking ahead to the future. Uh, uh, there have been people sold everything they had and went out and sat on a hillside because somebody told them the Lord was coming. Hmm. There's an old hymn, and I've heard Brother Clint sing it. We need to work till Jesus comes. We need to live every day like He's coming, but we need to prepare in case He doesn't come. Hmm. So I'm interested on how to effectively live in the present. Again, <laughs> rejoice in where God found you. Get excited about where we're headed. But you need to know how to live effectively right now. And I say, first of all, to live effectively in the present, we must focus on the priorities. If your focus is on anything other than the priorities of what your life should be focused on, you're going to be a mess. Your life's going to be a roller coaster. You're going to be up and down. You're going to be full of emotions. Listen, we're emotional people. I understand that. But we should not be controlled by our emotions. We ought to be controlled by faith. The reason a lot of churches uh, closed down last year is they were controlled by something other than faith. Hmm? Can I say, when we focus on these priorities, we will effectively live in the present. What priorities, preacher? First of all, becoming truly spiritual. There's a lot of folks come to church, but they're not spiritual. They're just not spiritual. You can't be spiritual without being biblical. And you can't be spiritual being worldly. Your mind can't be worldly-centered and be spiritual. To be spiritual, you've got to exercise the devotion we 
got this morning on the phone app. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. Uh, you need to uh, uh, spend time with the Lord and His Word and meditating and prayer. Uh, uh, you've got to give God more of your mind and your heart than you do this world. We need to become truly spiritual. That's why we can have a service and somebody like Miss Noreen jump up and sing that song and bless everybody because she was being led of the Spirit. But I've seen things like that happen in service and in the next moment somebody stand up and ask prayer for their dog. Now listen, dogs are cute. They're warm and fuzzly, fuzzy. I've got one, but they don't have a soul. Dogs aren't worth praying over. You know who you need to pray over? Lost people. Sick people. Not dogs. It shows somebody's immaturity and unspirituality. And I've seen things like that happen. Somebody just stand up and say something off the wall. And I do caution you, the devil always uses weak-minded people. And the devil would like nothing better than to destroy something when God's a blessing. Hmm? We've got to focus on the priorities by becoming truly spiritual. But not only that, by having our steps aligned behind Jesus. Not with him, not in front of him, behind him. He's Lord. We're to follow Jesus. Hmm? Where he leadeth, I will follow. Hmm? Folks don't swerve if they're following. Hmm? Can I say this? When you focus on the priorities by becoming truly spiritual and by having our steps aligned behind Jesus, you also have the priority of winning souls. The only reason Jesus left you here after he saved you was so that you could be a light and a witness to somebody else so they too could be saved. If it was all about going to heaven, he'd take us to heaven the moment he saved us. But you know what? There had never been a second generation church. The early church, the first church, uh, uh, as soon as they got saved, they went to heaven. We'd never heard about it. Mm -mm. The last thing Jesus did before he ascended into heaven is he reiterated the great commission to go and preach the gospel to everybody. Mm -mm. We, my dear friends, we've got to have our priorities straight. By the way, the Bible says, He that wins souls is wise. Mm -hmm. God help us to focus on the priorities. Now, can I say, everything in this world is designed to get our focus off of our true Christian priorities. Listen, you've got to have a job, you've got to eat, you, you need something to drive, you need a place to live, it's okay to have some recreation, all those things are important for our lives, but they need to be in their proper place. Jesus Christ needs to be first. You put him first, everything else goes right in its proper order. But we've got to focus on what our priorities really should be. If you're going to be a true Christian. I'm talking about present living Christian. So many people, all they want to talk about is where God found them. What a blessing. But what happens, Brother Tony, is they talk about it so much they start glorifying the sin that they used to be a part of. Hmm? You know... I, I really, I, I don't care about what you was involved in. What I care about is what Jesus delivered you from. There's a difference. Hmm? Brother Sidney Weaver, you talk to him next time you see him. There's a preacher, I won't call his name. As soon as I do, I'll be blasted on social media before I get home. This guy gives his testimony everywhere he goes when he preaches, and he preaches a lot. Sidney's heard him tell his testimony no less than 15 times, and Brother Brian, every time he tells it, it changes. It gets more exaggerated. Hmm? Sidney said the last time he heard it, it was so exaggerated that he won't go hear him again. Hmm? said all he's doing is glorifying sin. He's not glorifying Jesus. If all you do is put your mindset on going to heaven, you know what you do? You'll sit down and do nothing for God today. And that's what's happening in our churches. Everybody just sitting, waiting for the Lord to come. We've been listening and hearing, preaching since the mid-70s that the Lord's coming back, that He's coming back. 
So many people have sat down because they just say, the Lord's coming back. Uh, Randy, he's a coming. I promise you. Uh, we just don't know when. Uh, hey, it might not be for another 10 years. You're going to let 10, uh, 10 years, a generation of people uh, die and go to hell because you're sitting there just waiting for the Lord to come back? Paul said, for me to live is as Christ. Help us to focus on the priorities. Not only that, to be effective in the present, we must fight to stay afloat. I'm going to tell you something. We're in a battle. We're in a warfare. Our warfare is not with flesh and blood, spiritual wickedness in high places. I want to tell you there is a flood coming against us, a flood of adversity coming against us, and we must fight, fight, fight to stay afloat. Too many of God's people are drowning in despair. Hmm? How many remember Hee Haw? Three of us. Three of us remember Hee Haw. Hey, they're still playing on one of them MT, me TV show channels or something. I see it every now and then. I'll watch it, just watch it. Uh -huh. I think, boy, this was stupid. But anyway, my favorite... Bloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Whoa! Huh? Remember that? That was it. That's the average independent Baptist today. We're drowning in despair. Woe is me. Woe is me. Where's my juniper tree? Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's so bad. It's so bad. God don't love me. Uh, uh, God's not good to me. He's good to everybody but me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Get yourself a big pacifier. You're letting people trip over you and die and go to hell. We're drowning in despair. You need to fight to stay afloat. Listen. Don't you think the devil knows what makes you tick? Don't you think he knows what will knock you out of the faith? Uh, don't you think he'll throw everything he can at you? He'll put every wicked thought he can in your mind. Uh, he'll get you thinking about that you're useless, that you're not doing anything. Uh, next time you think you're useless, uh, give a tract to somebody that's lost uh, and look at the devil and say, Take that, devil! You just gave somebody to the gospel. That's not useless, that's glorious. We need to fight to stay afloat. So many are drowning in despair. When I say this, there are so many drowning in doubt. You know why you're doubting everything? Because you're either looking backwards or forwards. You're not looking at Jesus. If you're lying right behind Him, you can't doubt. You're following Him. You're just drowning in doubt. People at the church are mad at me. No, they're not. People at church are loaded up with problems like you are. They're not thinking about you at all. They're just trying to stay afloat. Brother Jim hasn't invited me to the farm. Hogwash, he had the hoedown special here last month. He was just too lazy to go. You just doubt everything. Jesus don't love me anymore. He's loved you with an everlasting love. He loved you before you even knew how to spell love. You're just drowning in doubt. And I say doubt is the enemy of faith. The just shall live by faith. God's given you the measure of faith. You just need to exercise it. Hmm? Went for my six-week follow-up follow up today. He said, I was doing good, I was strong. I said, can I start working out again because I'm getting fat? No. Not allowed to yet. I didn't tell him I'd been mowing the grass and been doing all kinds. He said, you're allowed to lift 30 pounds. I said, been doing that for about four weeks. Huh? Huh? So, but here's the thing. If you don't exercise, you get soft. Now, to be physically healthy, it takes a little more than exercise. It takes proper diet. I'm really not good on that end of it. It takes proper diet and exercise for you to be healthy. Just be spiritually healthy. My dear friends, you've got to exercise your faith. You do it by getting a verse and living that verse. And then get another verse and live that verse. Uh, 
Get a promise and believe that promise and bank your life on that promise. Then find you another promise uh, and bank your life on that promise. Put it into practice. Uh, a steady diet uh, and steady action upon that diet uh, will increase your faith. Uh, and as faith grows, doubt goes. Mm -hmm. Too many is drowning in doubt. I deal with folks all the time. Uh, where's Thaddeus? You haven't been here in a month. I need to come back here and pick on you. Remember back when you had dark hair? You remember, you remember when you got me that pastor, uh, what, do we, what do we call it, survival kit? He got me a survival kit. He made it. It's a big box. It's full of pacifiers, diapers, bottles, diaper cream, baby powder all of it. I'm, I'm coming back here to, I've run out I need more pacifiers you know what I'm saying uh, but friends like him you know who needs to study I got all kinds of illustrations just use that uh, so many people you know why you doubt because your relationship isn't secure in Jesus When your love in, with Jesus is right, you don't doubt. The problem is, you're no longer looking at Jesus. He's able, to, he's able to overcome everything. You're looking at you. And I'm here to tell you, whenever we get to looking at us, we have great cause to doubt. Hmm? You've got to fight to stay afloat. Many are drowning in despair. Too many are drowning in doubt. And then there are those who are drowning in their duties. They become weary in well-doing. They're trying to do so much. They're not effective in doing anything. You're trying to keep the house afloat, the job afloat, your spiritual life afloat. When you, come, you want to get involved in everything in church, you're signing up for choir, for nursery, uh, for vacuuming the floors. For, well, to do everything you've signed up to do, you will never sleep. You've got to put in for sleep 16 months from now. And you're drowning in that. You're failing at everything because you're not focusing on any one thing. You can't be everything. I've made it clear here at the church, I'm for everything. I just can't do everything. God burdens your heart to do something, let's do it. But don't expect me to do it, because God burdened you to do it. Can't do everything. Nobody can. We're just human. You've got to fight to stay afloat. Focus on the priorities, and then fight to stay afloat. thought about this. If you're going to live in the present, you've got to overcome your fear of failure. You've got to have fear that you won't fail, but your fear of failure is causing you to fail. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. If you are worried about being a castaway, guess what you won't become? A castaway because you'll keep your body under subjection you'll keep the main thing the main thing you keep focused on it I don't want to fail God when we fail God is when we think that we can handle it and we don't need him mm -mm. you need to fear failure but don't let the fear of failure run your life mm -mm. you ever seen a child that was afraid to breathe their parents had so disciplined them, so warned them, and so put so much fear in them, they, was, they just sit there. I mean, have you said, kids are supposed to be kids. They're going to do dumb things. You did. Huh? And if they do really dumb things, that's when you really get on them real good. But they're kids. Don't make them live in fear of being a kid. That's why, that's why I like my, where's my friend Sammy Joe. I like her. Huh? She's the only little girl we've ever had here that I've come out after church and see her climb up in a tree out there. Huh? 
Let her climb trees. Huh? She'll get old old enough soon, sooner here. She'll be like Kenzie, get up teenage here, and she won't want to climb trees no more. But let her be a kid, okay? Let them make mud pies. We got neighbors. They got three little boys. Them boys, they let them be boys now. I mean, they're, have you seen that, that detergent commercial where the kids are rolling around in the mud in the, in the backyard? That's these boys every day. They never wear shirts. It's a good thing they'd be muddy. I mean, from head to toe, they wear galoshes, shorts, and find every mud hole in the, in the community. These boys, they let them be boys. They're smart, but they're boys. I like them. Let them be kids. If you're so afraid of being a Christian, you'll never become one. We need to fear the Lord, respect Him, love Him, and adore Him. But don't fear being a Christian. And I say this, we're going to live presently. We need to learn to forgive others. What I've found is when people start doing real good with, with Jesus, it's, an, it's, it's this humanistic ability we have. We start looking around trying to find people who's not doing as good as us. That's dangerous. Because I promise you, number one, they're not doing as bad as you think they are. And number two, you're not doing as good as you think you are. Hmm? Hmm? But let me help you with something. You go at this thing as long as I've been at it, people are going to fail God. You're going to fail God. Learn to forgive others. It's a blessing not having a bitter spirit. When somebody messes up, be quick to forgive and be quick to try and restore them. Just forgive others. And unlike we heard preached at camp meeting, don't wait for them to come and ask for your forgiveness. Just forgive them. Hmm? God forbid... Brother Ray and I are great friends. Not just good, we're great friends. God forbid something go on between us, and I get mad at him, and he get mad at me, and then I die, and he never gets to hear me ask him to forgive me. He's going to spend the rest of his life miserable unless he learns to forgive me. My forgiveness is not contingent on whether or not somebody asks me to forgive them. My, my forgiveness is contingent on that's what the Bible teaches and that's what Jesus expects. So I'll forgive in compliance with the Lord. Huh? Can I say, when that prodigal son came home, the father didn't wait for the boy to say, Father, forgive me. That father ran on him and kissed him. Hmm? That father forgave him long before that boy ever came into view. Are you listening? So I'm trying to help you learn to forgive others. It don't matter what they do. Don't matter where they've been. Don't matter. It's only by the grace of God. It's not you on the other side of the conversation. Are you listening? Uh, learn to forgive them. Learn to go the extra mile. And I tell you what, when them chickens come home to roost, guess what? They'll be the first ones in line to forgive you. Hmm? By the way, you don't have to have something big in your life to be forgiven over. A little, a little white lie is still sin. Hmm? Huh? A little bitter spirit still sin. Learn to forgive. Life is so much enjoy more enjoyable when you don't carry around all that junk. Lord have mercy. Because unforgiveness brings a whole lot of junk with it. So don't you say, well, preacher, you don't know what they've done. No, I don't. But I know what I did to Jesus that hung him on the cross. And he forgave me. And I know sometimes it's hard to forgive. I'm not trying to dismiss it as something easy. But it's so much better on you when you learn to forgive. Brother Greg says this, He who angers you controls you. It's so much easier when you learn to forgive and you can be so much more Christ-like. And by the way, you can help so many more people when you learn to forgive. Huh? Listen, I thought about this. If we're going to live presently, effectively, this present time. We need to learn to feel for folks. You gotta learn to care for people. 
Jesus does. He said, cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. You've got to learn to have sympathy for people and empathy if you've walked in their shoes. Learn to care about others as much as you care about yourself. Boy, what kind of Christianity would we have if that was... I believe there's a golden rule somewhere in the Bible about do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I wonder if we cared about others as much as we cared about ourselves. Hmm? Uh, learn to feel for folks. Folks are going through it. I say this, and in, in, in sometimes I don't think it registers. If you knew the hurt behind the smiles that people come to church with, we would be, hey, listen, we got a great church. Everybody that comes and visits here talks about how friendly we are. Uh, every preacher talks about how easy it is to preach. What a great church we have. How much greater of a church could we be if we really would just feel for folks? And I know many of you do. But that ought to be a main principle in our lives. I'm just going to care about somebody else today. Hmm? If we would really pray for others and care for others like we're supposed to, we wouldn't have time to pray for ourselves and care about ourselves. But guess what? That's when the Lord kicks in. He just goes ahead and dumps some extra handful on purpose on us because we're busy caring about everybody else. I've learned that, friend. It'd help you. It'd help you. Just start feeling for folks. There's a fellow back there on that banner, Brother Frank Stinson. I love Brother Frank. Can't wait to see him again. What a jewel he was in so many ways. Lord have mercy so many ways. But Frank would spend all week long praying, asking for God to show him somebody in the church that he could be good to. He was a true Barnabas. Sometimes he might just come up and slip you a piece of candy. Sometimes he might take you out to lunch. I know of many times him giving a lot of money to folks who was really couldn't, didn't have money to pay their bills. I know folks that couldn't afford their medication. He'd go get their medication. Frank was just constantly praying who God would have him be good to. Boy, what kind of church would we have if we all did that? Lord, show me somebody I can just go put my arm around and tell them I appreciate them. Hmm? Boy, if you was here back in those days, I promise you, there was some time Frank come up and gave you a word of encouragement. That's just who he was. That's what we ought to all be, an encourager for Christ. Now, I thought about this last week. If we're going to effectively live in this present time, it's okay to go back and look where God brought you from. It's okay to get excited about where we're headed. But if we're going to effectively live today, you've got to find time to spend with Jesus. You've got to just find time. Spend some alone time with Him. Find time to let Him just speak to you, cultivate you, woo you, overwhelm you. Spend time reading and talking to Him and meditating on Him. Just spend time alone with Jesus. It'll change the world. You can always tell those that have been that have been with Jesus, and you can tell those that haven't. Hmm? Isn't that one of the indictments of the apostles? They took note that they had been with Jesus. Those things that you and Jesus spend time in secret over, God has a way of revealing them openly to other people. People know when you've been with Jesus, and they know when you haven't. If we're going to be effective, you've got to spend time with Him. It's all about Him. Huh? Now listen, I get it. We live in a busy, busy, busy world. Nobody has enough time. You're working so many hours a week. You're running the youngins and the grand youngins everywhere. You, you, so many of you drive so far. I mean, there's so much going on. You've got to find quality time spent with Jesus just find that time make that time you can make time for everything else you need to make time with Jesus might be getting up just a few minutes earlier every day or staying up a little later every night or somewhere throughout your day just shutting everything off instead of taking a lunch hour to eat once you take a lunch hour to spend with Jesus just find some time to spend with him I come to the, out here to my office. First thing I do every time I come to church 
as I come in here and spend some time with Jesus. Because I know once I get in there, phone's going to start ringing, something's going to start happening, this going on, that's going on. So I always start my time with Jesus. Makes my time so much better. you got to find time with Him. And if you do, you'll live effectively and you'll flourish in this present time. Oh, it's going to be wonderful up on yonder. But i got good news. It can be wonderful right now. We've just got to make up our mind. You're going to live every day as unto Christ. Let Him affect you every day. Like He affected you when He found you. And like He's going to affect you. Let Him affect you every day. And look and see if your days aren't a whole lot brighter. And Jesus shines a little bit more in your life. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get us on. Maybe you need to come talk to Him now. Maybe He spoke to your heart about something. Maybe put somebody on your heart. You need to go and put your arm around. Just tell them you love them. I don't know. But he's picking out a song. Mr. Renee's coming. Well, they're getting that song ready. Some are already praying. Boy, I love seeing these young people on the altar. My folks are praying. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. Lord, I'm thankful where you brought us from. Thankful where we're headed. But God, help us not to lose sight that there are folks all around us that need to see Jesus in us. Help us to live effectively every day. Help us to win folks to Christ in this day and age. Lord, heaven be so much sweeter if we take more folks with us. So God, God bless this invitation. You know where folks are. Speak to them, help them, encourage them. We'll bless you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.